Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 295th New Social Environment. I'm Jess Chen, Events Assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Liz Cohen, Deandra Lawson, Julio Cesar Morales, and Olga Vizo about Liz Cohen's exhibition, Body Magic, at the ASU Art Museum. We're also thrilled to close today's program with a poem by Jenny Zhang, read by our publisher and artistic director, Fong H. Bowie. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy, uh, the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that have lost their lives to this violence. I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guests. Photographer and performance artist Liz Cohen focuses on the intersections of immigration, industry, labor, and women's representation in popular media. Cohen is best known for her bodywork project in which she simultaneously transformed an East German Trabant into an American El Camino lowrider while inhabiting a new identity herself as a car customizer and bikini model. Her show Body Magic Liz Cohen is up at the Arizona State University Art Museum through May 29th. Curatorial Assistant in the Wallace Annenberg Photography Department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Deandra Lawson completed her MA in Art History through the LACMA ASU Master's Fellowship in Art History. She co-curated recently Eleanor Anton, Times Arrow, and Richard Prince, Untitled Cowboy. Her research includes contemporary art and photography, as well as contemporary African diasporic artistic production. Artist, educator, writer, and senior curator at the Arizona State University Art Museum, Julio Cesar Morales' work uh, includes so, uh, solo exhibitions with Superflex, Suzanne Lacey, and many, many others. His artwork explores labor, migration, and underground economies, and has been shown at the Lyon Biennale, the Istanbul Biennale, uh, and Prospect 3, among others. And finally, we are joined by curator, writer, and contemporary art historian Olga Vizo, who is based at Arizona State University's Herberger uh, Institute for Design and the Arts. Vizo was previously the executive director of the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis and director and curator at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. She is a scholar of contemporary and Latin American art with a focus on the contemporary art of Cuba. Olga, take it away. Fantastic. Good to be with you all. Nice. Hello to everybody on screen. And uh, thank you, Jess. Thank you, Fong, Nick, Georgia, everyone at the rail staff for the opportunity to host um, and curate the conversation today um, with all my colleagues from ASU. So just to give you a little context about um, all of this before we kick off um, the conversation. Um, for the last three years, um, I've been based um, at the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts, which is the largest comprehensive arts and design school in the country with schools of film, dance, theater, art, design, a museum, a performing arts center, an incredible platform. And uh, part of the work that I do there is uh, working on a variety of partnerships, one with James Terrell at Roden Crater uh, here in Northern Arizona up in Flagstaff. Uh, and it's centered around building an interdisciplinary academic um, environment with the uh, crater at the center. And the second is the ASU LACMA Fellowship Program in Art History, which was a program we launched three years ago to diversify the museum field and accelerate the careers of museum professionals already working in museums by giving them access to a graduate degree. So I get to work with these amazing colleagues here. Um, Liz, who's on the art faculty at ASU, Julio, who, are, who is the curator at the ASU Art Museum, and Deandra Lawson, who is the, at the LA County Museum uh, and uh, on the curatorial staff uh, in the photo department and is a recent graduate of the fellowship program, indeed the inaugural class. And I, when I say recent, I mean recent. She graduated on Friday 
with many awards um, and accolades. And I have to say, I've, I've been very fortunate over the last three years to be um, a mentor to uh, Deandra in this program. And it really has been one of my true highlights um, during my time at ASU to work with Deandra uh, as a fellow, as a colleague curator, as a writer and a real powerful voice and perspective to share here. So Deandra uh, had, uh, as part of her externship experience in the fellowship program, um, shadowed um, uh, curators, um, including myself and Julio, and uh, was able to be, I'd say, a really keen observer as Julio and Liz were preparing uh, the exhibition that is on view now at the ASU Art Museum, and in particular, a new commission in the production of that commission. So I've invited Deandra to moderate a conversation between the two of them to talk about that new work, the last 10 years, um, the current moment, Liz's relationship and work to art history, to lowrider culture, and also to Julio and Liz, who um, emerged together as artists in the 90s in San Francisco. So a lot to talk about. So Deandra, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that warm introduction and thank you to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for inviting us to be here. Thank you to our audience who's joining us from around the country and for your time and attention today. We so appreciate you and congratulations to Liz Cohen and to Julio on this incredible exhibition, Body Magic which will be on view at the Arizona State University Art Museum through May 29th. Um, so just give me one moment and I'll share my screen and we can, um, we can get started. Great. Um, so this is a, the installation view of the exhibition, oops, excuse me, um, Body Magic, which as Jess kindly introduced is an exhibition that for the first time really showcases all aspects of Liz Cohen's body work series, which is a body of work that she has been involved in for at least a decade. For the Body Works series, Liz transformed many things. She transformed two cars, an American El Camino and an East German Turbant into a low rider. She also transformed her own body to become a bikini model for her car to advertise her car at low rider shows. And we'll see throughout um, this exploration today how um, Liz has really used her own body as, um, as the material. Um, the show, I think, really um, explores overall Liz's experience as a first-generation Latina and as a child of the Cold War. Um, so as Olga mentioned, I was sort of collaborated with Liz and Julio this last fall. I wrote an essay about a new body of work, which makes its debut in this exhibition, called Body Magic, in which Liz worked with the low rider, low rider car model, Daza Del Rio, who you see featured here on the left, to produce a new body of photographs featuring the, um, or in emulation of Robert Maplethorpe's um, depictions of the first female bodybuilder, Lisa Lyon. Um, Lisa Lyon um, and Robert Maplethorpe collaborated extensively. They had about a six year collaboration that was also a partnership and he photographed Lion more than um, any of his subjects. So it was through Lion, and I would say Daza Del Rio, that um, Liz found inspiration um, in this new body of work, which she again transformed her own body um, <clears throat> for the project. <clears throat> Needless to say, uh, Cohen's practice is immersive. <laughs> for two decades, she's situated herself inside marginalized communities or within neighborhoods that are at the margins of city centers. She's um, exploring, I think, what it constitutes through this work, what it, what it constitutes membership and what constitutes belonging. Her work has led her to work with militia member tattoo artists, Panamanian transgender sex workers, bikini models, and custom car fabricators. So Liz, 
Um, we're all so inspired by your work and I thought we could start from the top. <laughs> you earned your, um, your born, you were born and raised in Phoenix where you are now, although presently you're in Flagstaff, yes. um, just a couple hours north of the city. You earned your BA um, at Tufts in philosophy and your MFA in photography at the California College of Arts in San Francisco. And I understand it really was at your San, in San Francisco that you really began your exploration into <clears throat> different types of labor, um, creative labor, as well as just you began sort of your apprenticeships working with different automotive mechanics. It was also in San Francisco you met Julio. So I thought we could sort of begin here and I would love if you could tell us more about sort of your um, early thinking as an artist and your interests. And also um, if you and Julio could share a bit about how you met and sort of the scene in San Francisco at the time. Yeah, thank you so much for the beautiful introduction, Deandra. And um, I'd like to thank Fong and Jess and the rest of the Brooklyn Rail team for the opportunity um, to speak with everyone today. And Olga, thank you for organizing this. It's really, um, really special. And um, Deandra and Julio, thank you for you know paying attention and championing my work. And um, I just, it's really exciting to get to do all this together. So, so I guess to address you know my early thinking um, as an artist, I had um, you know I was thinking a lot after I um, finished school. I thought a lot about what it, what my responsibility was to Latin America and the developing world as a first generation U.S. American with Colombian parents. I had spent my summers traveling to visit family and. Um, and I had also grown up and my parents were, um, my parents were communists when they lived in Colombia. And I had grown up uh, traveling to China and the USSR and hearing very lively conversations that had to do with the Cold War at the dinner table and participating in those conversations. And I, I was thinking a lot about just what did it mean to be who I am and how do I participate in the fabric of US American culture in a way that's meaningful. So I decided to go to Panama where my pater paternal grandmother was living and uh, work with a group of transgender sex workers on the fringe of the US canal zone. And I was actually something I was, I was surprised to meet them. I was going originally to photograph on the military bases. And um, I was on a street called La Avenida Cuatro de Julio or 4th of July Avenue or, um, also known as La, La Avenida de los Martires, the Avenue of the Martyrs, which um, is on the fringe of the old US Canal Zone. And that's where um, this group of people were working. And I started to talk to them and their, um, their main clientele were US servicemen. And that became very interesting to me in terms of the dynamic between the United States and Latin America and Panama being this kind of passageway with its trade route and this really severe cut into this body of land. And so I think that was a moment when I really became more conscious of thinking of the body, when I was thinking about this kind of slit and this gouge in the land, and, um, and then thinking about um, the engineering of the body and the kind of the things that we all go through to try to belong and feel at home in some way. And, um, and so as I spent four years in, you know, on and off in Panama, over time, you know, we developed relationships and um, towards the end of that time, um, Lynette, one of the people I was working with, started to dress me up and she wanted me to be on the street with her and everybody else. And I did that, but I wasn't taking sex work and um, I hadn't had the same gender kind of journey in my life. And so it just, it started to really highlight to me that I needed to do something different. And so that's when I thought about working on a piece with a car, which has a lot to do with national identity and kind of personal identity. And, you know, there was just some kind of, you know, serendipitous opportunities that happened. And I just thought about how can I find a way to work where I can look at something that I'm curious about, you know, I can be a voyeur and at the same time have an opportunity um, to become a genuine member, even if I'm a very fringe or very odd freak member. 
And so I just, I decided to build this car and it, you know, join the custom car world and work among, you know, guys in the shops. And so I did that for 10 years that, you know, I was working in, in shops, um, working on this car that, um, you know, this little Trabant that was trying to become a El Camino. So I don't know if that. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I mean, and, and did you start out knowing that you wanted to transform? I mean, it seems like in sort of early performances like this and bikini car wash, like, could you tell us sort of how like the progression of, of apprenticing and then transforming the car sort of happened? So I had to go, I had an opportunity to go to Germany to Academy Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart. And Stuttgart is kind of the automotive capital of Germany. And the Mercedes factory is there. And I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe I can take this German Mercedes and turn it into a little station wagon. And that might be kind of easy to make look like an El Camino. I had like the fixation on the El Camino already. And so <laughs> I needed to find money. I needed to, I needed to work to get, to get, to, to get this car. And so I decided to have, you know, a car wash, which was an immediate sign that I should not be an entrepreneur. I did not, <laughs> I broke even, but um, the gesture really announced, um, the gesture really announced the kind of the, the piece that was going to come into the world somehow and the kind of experience I was going to have. I didn't know for the next, you know, many years of my life, I thought it was going to be kind of like a six month thing that I would build this car in a residency and it would be like done. And, um, and then I got to Germany and I went to Berlin and I was having dinner um, with somebody who started telling me about the Trabant and then one drove by. And that, that was when I realized that it made no sense to do this with a Mercedes and that Trabants were $400 at the time, which was manageable too. Um, but in any case, the narrative, I mean, the idea that there was this huge economic transition that um, like Germany was, had gone through and was going through with the reunification and the kind of, the kind of loss and reinvention, um, you know, culturally and, um, and just all the idealism behind all of it, you know, the, so anyway, that was, that was, um, kind of what brought me to the Trabant and kind of changed things a bit. And then as I went along, I learned things. So I didn't, I didn't even, it didn't even cross my imagination that I could build a transformer car. At first, it was gonna be a very light modification. And then as I was thinking more about the issues of belonging and identity and um, being committed to the idea of a continuous self, I didn't want the car to lose track of it's past. And so that's when I started thinking that maybe it could be a transformer car. And as I worked in shops and I met more people and I, my mentors kind of changed when I started working with Bill Cherry at Elwood Body Works in Scottsdale. And he had built cars um, for NASCAR. Like, I just, I was with somebody that I, I was like, oh, what do you think about this? Could I do it? He's like, yeah, I want to work. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, the bikini car washes were then, they were fundraisers. It was one. Yeah, it was, a, it was, it was, a, a, it was a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> and Julio, this is you in the image, right? No, that, that actually is not me. I, oh, <laughs> that's uh, Clayton. Yes. Clayton was helping, uh, finish up the cars and, okay. you know, this was an important time, at least for, you know, the underground art scene in San Francisco, you know, Liz and I met in the late 90s when Liz was going to CCA, I was going to SFAI. And essentially we, you know, we, we became friends and we would get together. And I remember when Liz started talking about low riding, you know, I grew up with low riders in San Isidro. And um, when I moved to the United States and uh, well versed and going to car shows and seeing the bikini models. And I just thought it was such a unique and important um, project that Liz was gonna embark on. It was pretty amazing to have those initial conversations and actually be there at the first, you know, at the bikini car wash. I mean, Liz washed my 1963 Carmen Ghia, and I've been, for the last couple of years, I've been looking for that photograph and I can't find it in my archive, unfortunately. Oh, we got to um, look in my archive. <laughs> right, I know, exactly. And so I was really thrilled, you know, uh, fast forward to 2018 when Liz came here again to um, Arizona 
And I was just excited to, to basically work with her and collaborate with her as a curator to develop the project further and show everything that she had been working on for the past, you know, almost 20 years. And I have to say, I mean, that time that we were in San Francisco, Julio, was, I think, a very kind of special moment. It was really, you know, an electric kind of moment with the artists that were working in San Francisco. And when we connected and this kind of vibrant art scene that we were a part of and the Latinx art scene and you were at Galeria de la Raza at that time, mm -hmm. I think it was just yeah. kind of amazing. But. And, you know, and this happened at, what is this? Spanganga, I can never yeah, get that. Yeah, Spanganga, Abner Nolan. Yes. Was um, was curating the space and this was the inaugural show. And this is on the corner of 19th Street and Cap for those of you that know San Francisco, so. Pretty gritty part. And essentially what was happening, there is so many amazing artist run spaces around that time. And that also inspired me to open Queen's Nails around that time as well. And it, it ran for nine years and we had more than 150 exhibitions. And um, it, it just, just a really great time to be a young emerging artist in San Francisco. It seems so both of you have really sort of from the get go in the early, earliest um, years of your careers really in different ways interested in sort of grassroots activities or uh, building community or forming community, um, thinking about what it means to be outside or inside or um, on the margins or bringing into the margins. And, and Liz, as we think about um, sort of how Canal really um, fed into your later, um, your later explorations with, uh, with the Traban Tamino, um, in terms of photographic history, you know, I'm sort of reminded of figures like Arbus or folks like Laura Aguilar um, who are documenting their communities, putting their communities in the, in the foregrounds or maybe in the case of Arbus um, on the outside and looking in. Um, in terms of sort of more feminist practice, thinking of someone like Eleanor Anton, who like you is um, using their body as material, as a, as a mode of transformation. Um, but I'm curious sort of if we think about somebody like Cindy Sherman, who we all know of course is um, very much, whose practice is very much engaged with transformation and taking on identities. I wonder how you situate yourself if, if if the inquiry is about transformation or if it's more to do with exploration and if you could speak to maybe the nuance or difference there that that's happening and sort of in the context of these of these um of your predecessors of photographic predecessors yeah thank you for asking that question i mean exploration is a big part of it and you know i really i admire cindy sherman's work and you know i, I looked at it you know, since I was a student. Um, but I do have to say, you know, it's, it's a really different practice in many, many ways. Um, you know, uh, my work is so durational, right? And so any anytime I'm even emulating somebody, um, there's a kind of long relationship with that kind of image, you know, or that person or a community or a world that I'm um, really entering and collecting experience. And I also, I haven't decided, um, very much about anything as I start to interact with people on my subjects. It's really because my work has to do with belonging and um, really being a part of something, I come in without a kind of, um, I don't come in with like a lens of judgment, you know? So in that sense, um, my work doesn't start as a critique. Um, it starts as, you know, an exploration. And um, I don't know if that answers the question, but it is a really, um, you know, I, I am using my body and I am transforming it, but the, but the range of kind of people I inhabit is smaller. <laughs> and also um, when I go out and I experience over time, I mean, in a way it's kind of like method acting that I'm spending a long time, but it's different in the sense that, um, what I'm doing really becomes a part of my life when you are around something for 20 years and it's your primary activity, um, that really, it just doesn't separate anymore. And so um, I guess I could say that. 
Yeah, I mean, that was something I wanted to sort of get at today is sort of dwell on this idea of immersive practice. Because I know you had mentioned with the canal series that ultimately you kind of, you know, upon completing the project or the series kind of, I think, reflected that you know, I'm, I'm not, I am a biological female and I'm not part of this community and I am kind of outside and like what, to what extent could you, could you have become a member? I mean, as, as we see in this image here, you um, sort of, you know, you're dressing up. And so I'm interested in sort of this idea of immersion, like to what extent do we measure like a, like a, uh, like is if the goal is to become like is the goal to become an insider and and if 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 you can't how does that measure sort of how you're you're viewing the project if that makes sense well i guess it's it's not an insider at any cost right i mean it has to have some integrity to the process and to myself um, and so, like I said, I'm not interested in losing myself or, you know, I'm interested in adding or learning. Um, and, you know, there is a certain kind of level of authenticity that's important. So I think that the key is, is what are the, what are the parameters for defining the group, right? And so depending on how the group is defined, if it's, if it's a friendship group or a peer group, I mean, we, you know, during the time period that I was spending in Panama, there was a lot of affection between me and the people that I was hanging out with. I mean, we spent a lot of time together. We had experiences that we collected over time together. So that's one kind of a group to be a part of, but um, there were other layers of it that maybe made that kind of circle of what being the group is smaller. And those were, those were things that I couldn't experience or couldn't share in a way that I thought um, was meaningful. Um, and so I guess, you know, this kind of issue of belonging is really tricky, right? Cause, cause you know, you can be a freak member of something and be really on the edge of that circle or just like kind of on the, on the border of something and have one toe in one world and one toe in another. And, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. And it reminds me of your comment earlier about this notion of like the continuous self. And I think part of like the continuous self is this idea that we're constantly interacting and making new relationships and, and make, having new encounters. Yeah. Um, and so while, while maybe your um, immersion in a certain community was intentional, that like it was, it was a dynamic immersion. It wasn't like, it wasn't one thing. It wasn't, it was complex as with any sort of, um, uh, with any sort of relationship. Yeah, and it's it's easier to talk about it looking back on it than it would have been right. at the time, or you know, I didn't know what would happen, right? So, right. This is the the famed Trabantamino as it's um, beautifully presented in the exhibition, and um, coming out of that earlier work. Um, Julio, I would just love if you could speak to sort of your curatorial uh, thinking and sort of your goals for um, framing the exhibition. Um, viewers are really focused in on only the body work series, so they're not um, being sort of, um, uh, you know, they're not, uh, you know, seeing Liz's earlier works, but I was just wondering if you could tell us your hopes um, and uh, thinking for, for curating the, the show. Sure, um, you know, being you know, an insider really with this work um, was in a way more difficult to curate than in other exhibitions. Um, but I think really through a series of conversations with Liz kind of helped shape how we would present the, the project. And of course um, it was um, even more difficult to produce this exhibition during COVID and essentially some of the ideas we had were basically um, had to be bypassed because of the pandemic. Um, but I think, you know, in the exhibition, you know, how do you present the, the, the question to myself of how, how do you present 20 years of an artist's work um, and, and really touch base on the initial objectives of the work and also at the same time be being true to how, um, how one, um, one's body um, transforms as well. And I think that was one of the things that Liz and I talked about because the new commission work is basically um, 17, 18 years later since she started the project. 
And so that was one of the aspects that we wanted to focus on. So we divided the exhibition in two gallery spaces where you see the earlier work and the making of the work. And, on, and then you see the transformation. So we, we see transformation that is happening between these two eras and focusing, honing in on the collaboration with Daza del Rio um, in the photographs upstairs. And so I don't wanna fast forward all the, the, all the images, but um, I wanted to actually also talk about um, how Liz was actually um, accepted in the low riding community because she actually was the model and she was the maker and she actually did compete in, in these competitions. And Liz, can I ask you to talk a little bit about that um, in regards to um, New Mexico and, and um, other experiences that you had um, as uh, competing and also at the same time when you first met Daza del Rio? Yeah, so well, I first met Daza in 2003 in um, Fresno at a show, which is, it was at a Lowrider Super Show, which is a Lowrider Magazine sanctioned show, really big show. And um, there we are together. Um, and uh, Daza was just like electrifying. And this is, she's like the kind of like the Gaga of low riding or the Madonna of low riding. She's super, she's merchandised around herself. She's an amazing entrepreneur. Um, and she would go to these shows and she still, you know, once in a while when she goes to a show now, she still goes with her mom. Like her mom goes with her everywhere and her mom manages the money and, and Daza, you know, manages the crowd and she has all of her merch. And so anyways, I had been looking at images of her and thinking about the way she was posing. And I was, you know, I, I introduced myself to her and she just immediately said, could you come with me to the bathroom? And she didn't want to go alone. And so that's how Daza and I met. And um, and then I guess in terms of competing, the first time I competed was in Española at the Main Street Showdown. And Española is the self-proclaimed um, lowrider capital of the world. And, you know, I was really anxious to do my first, like go to the show as a competitor for the first time as someone that was showing a vehicle. And it was really amazing. I was I was, I had the warmest welcome from Frank Silva, who was a many time low riding world champion. And um, I got first place in my um, category, which is some subcompact radical. But it was really interesting because it was a moment I had to learn. Well, not learn, but I just had, it was a moment that I had to, I realized how much restraint I was going to have to exercise with the car as I went forward because by winning in that competition, I qualified for the world championship in Las Vegas. And um, so Frank went through the car with me and he told me what I'd have to do to win. He's like, I think you have a chance of winning the world championship, but basically I would have needed to, to change the paint. I probably would have needed to do some engraving, some etching in the glass and the Trabant would have lost it's like, I mean, it would have been gone, you know? And so that was like an interesting moment where I really had to, in my mind, like assert why I had made my decisions the way I had and the kind of build and especially the finishing of the car. Um, but yeah, no, the comp the competing was amazing. And um, um, I didn't, I didn't, I've never modeled at a show actually. So I had only done that and I've only done that in photographs and um, yeah, I went with my family. Those are family events. And so big family affair, very, very interesting. So amazing kind of experience. And so you had sort of this idea of, you know, you had figures like Daza del Rio um, in mind and as, as muses, as reference points, you know, these sort of pinup models and sort of wondering if you could speak to how you then use, you know, use, use those reference points to then upturn them in of turn them as of course you're doing here um, in this image where you're breastfeeding your son. Yeah, I mean, I think like necessity breeds invention. <laughs> you know, it's like I had a kid and I still wanted to make art and I still wanted to be able to have exhibitions. And so he just came with me everywhere <laughs> before he could walk. Um, and um, no, I, this was a really kind of amazing opportunity to have work produced by Ballroom Marfa and, um, you know, Fairfax um, Dorn really like made this possible. And I, I basically, I brought my whole family on the shoot. My mom came, my husband came, there are photos in the series of my husband as well. And, um, and in any case, you know, yeah, I've been looking at Daza and most of my, um, 
most of the poses I'd been doing up to this point had um, had to do with Daza. And looking at Daza, there's a lot about the way she turns her face, she uses her face, um, the way she uses her body. And, um, and then, you know, I also think you just have like images in your memory, but um, I wanted to have a nursing image. I'd also had an experience where, you know, a, ga a gallerist had told me we had a show coming up and it told me like, no, like no nursing images. <laughs> and so I was like, I have to make my nursing images. That's like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and um, so in any case, I was just trying things. But. Yeah. I mean, so let's look, let's look at, let's look at pictures of Daza together. I mean, this is an incredible, I mean, I just love the way that you curated this Julio with the projection and then bringing sort of, I mean, Liz, you're an, uh, a collector of, these are all low writer magazines, correct? Sort of displayed. And so those are, you know, bringing in the archive into the conversation yeah. as the, well as your props. All the, heels, all the high heels have, have been worn in every <laughs> photo shoot. And so it was almost like Kevin, because I love archives. <laughs> and, uh, when I went to Liz's studio, I'm like, okay, we got to have your low rider magazine. So we got to have your high heels. Um, parts of the car when it was still the Trabant um, in its original form. And these platforms actually that you see that display the ephemera, they actually come, what do you call these lists? They actually come from the patterns that you oh, basically do the cuts for the body of the car. Yeah, just my my um, templates for the floorboards and yeah, my samples. So yeah, yeah, so those are um, basically sampled off the templates um, and that's how we showcase the ephemera. I sort of just wanted to nod to, I mean, Daza Del Rio really came up in the 1990s in Los Angeles and sort of I wanted to speak to sort of bring into conversation, of course, the long history of low writing in Southern California sort of as, as a result of the Great Depression and sort of working class, you know, guys wanting to compete with fancy cars on the street. And so sort of all sorts of you know, drag racing and all sorts of subcultures begin to emerge. And um, Julio, you had in your timeline in the exhibition, sort of, you know, the Ladybugs Car Club in, in, East, in East Los, in East Los Angeles in 1975. Um, and so Daza is really, I think, um, inheriting um, this legacy. These are images of Daza on Lowrider magazine and, and Liz, your emulation sort of of her, but advertising your own vehicle. An early fan image of, of Daza. And so I'm curious, Liz, if you could speak to Daza as a muse for you and why she's a muse for you. Um, yeah, and why she stands out to you um, um, in the Lowrider community as a model in the Lowrider community. Yeah, I mean, Daz is really an icon in low riding, and she's also someone that's an unusual member in the sense that um, she's not Chicana. One of her parents is from Colombia and the other parent is from Peru. So we share that kind of Colombian American um, background and um, we're, we hover around the same age. And, um, and also one thing about Daza is that her relationship to photography and the camera are fascinating to me. She's very in control. And she understands, um, she understands what photographers do so well that I feel like she's like, she's ready at like a nanosecond before the photographer pushes a shutter. And so it's a very interesting control dynamic with her when I've observed her at the shows. And I mean, when we were doing the photo shoot, I mean, Julio will laugh and De Deandra was there too. And remember that, you know, when, as soon as the camera came out, Daza looked at the lens and just said, are you ready for me? And she was <laughs> ready. I mean, there was no. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so anyway, as a person that, you know, has a deep relationship with photography, Daza as a subject um, for portraiture is kind of, you know, she's very intriguing. And, and also just her sense of entrepreneurship and her her relationship to her body and how she uses it. And just, you know, she just engages in so much kind of joy um, and is very encouraging to other people. Um, she's taken a lot of young low rider models under her wing and she's just, she's just a great person. I mean, in many ways, she's a very, she's, um, 
like a natural, but also sort of um, unusual um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, point of comparison for somebody like uh, Lisa Lyon, um, who is also sort of, you know, taking control of her body. I mean, she, Lyon really spoke about how she considered herself a performance artist more before a model. And actually in Patricia Morris Rose sort of biography of Maplethorpe, you know, she makes note of how, you know, Maplethorpe really resented that and really pushed against that um, for Lyon that he really um, uh, resented the fact that she um, insisted on, on claiming an identity as a performance artist. Um, and it, so it seems to me that Lisa Lyon and Daza Del Rio are opposite sides of the same coin. And I wonder if you could either Julio or Liz if speak to her, um, you know, in relationship uh, and to your series. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I will say they both are people that are extremely deliberate, or at least, you know, during the time that they're engaging in these activities, very, very deliberate about um, about the image and how the image appears. And I mean, Lisa Lyon, I mean, she's so elusive, you know, I, it's so hard to find out a lot about her, but, you know, she only competed in this world championship once. I mean, she really did think of herself as a performance artist. And I've seen very little um, video footage of her um, actually bodybuilding, like, you know, competing in bodybuilding. <laughs> actually, the only thing I've seen is a clip from a uh, a movie, The Hustler from Muscle Beach. But, um, <laughs> but what surprised me is that she, I, I knew she had a background in dance, but the way she comes to the bodybuilding poses are all through dance. It's super graceful. It's very different than I was expecting. I mean, she's definitely a one and only, you know? I mean, this is a person that um, has a, a, a clear and studied um, vision, you know? Um, and again, the dynamic with the camera and the, the lens, I, you know, I think that um, who she is really comes through in the images more than maybe in some of other Maplethorpe's images where um, I think that the subjects can become very much to form, you know, and then in, in the Lisa Lyon images is both form and this real assertion of herself, you know, so I, that's how I see it. I don't know, Julio, if you have anything to add to that. No, no, I think you said it well. I mean, I'm reminded, Liz, of you, you mentioned that, you know, for the low rider posing, like they didn't want you to do an image of yourself breastfeeding, right? And so, and when Daza Del Rio and I were in your studio and we were looking sort of at images of Lisa Lyon together, Daza remarked to me, well, they would have never let me pose like that in low rider. And so I think there's also for Daza too, I mean, and here I'm speculating, but there was an opportunity in this body of work to assert herself in a way that she's not able to um, sort of as a low rider model. And so I think that's kind of the, like that's the pin, like that's where there's yeah. like an interesting tension that I think is emerging. Although um, we'll go further for her, cause I do have to say, I mean, she in a way she didn't give herself as much credit as she should have because she really blew up what had happened before in low rider modeling when she showed up for her first shoot for Lowrider Magazine, she showed up with lingerie and they had never done a cover or a photo shoot with lingerie. And it became her signature. She had a white and a black bodice um, that she would wear. Um, a little different than this. These are more kind of s and -E and or just more, it's a different, it's a different feel. But, um, but yeah, I think this takes it to another place because these mm -hmm. images also have to do with dominance in a way. And, um, and that's, maybe a little bit different than what she's doing um, in the magazines. It, this is the, the, the dynamic is different, I guess. And, you know, she also had um, a little bit of a hard time with the more androgynous images that you were right. recreating. Can you talk a little bit about that, Liz? Because I know it, it kind of resolved itself, but yeah, that was I mean something new for her. You know, yeah, I mean, new. for her, like, you know, her image is part of her business, you know, and so it became, I think, a little terrifying that these images would be circulated and they could damage the image, you know, that she's worked hard to, you know, control and create. And, um, and so, yeah, it was, it was awkward for her at a certain point. And for both of us, really, because at the end of the day, it's like a fool's errand to try to emulate someone that was doing this 
kind of bodybuilding when she was in her twenties and Daz and I are, you know, hovering around 50. So, um, there were, you know, there was like the aging and security stuff going on. There was, you know, the stuff around controlling the image. Um, I don't know how much more I can say about it, but. I love these series that you made of yourself too, as a result of the project, Liz, and we can really see the transformation of your own body here. Um, just really beautiful poses. And I'm reminded of sort of, you know, in the, in the context of the exhibition, how you have the two floors, right? Where you're sort of the earlier versions of you sort of in these sort of bikini pinup poses and then this, and the, this later work. Um, and, you know, you mentioned aging as sort of a component of this, of this exploration. I wonder if you could sort of speak the, to that meaning now or sort of looking back on, on the series now. Well, you know, when, um, when Julio gave me the opportunity to produce a new body of work for the exhibition and the kind of challenge of using my body again came up, I mean, you know, it was a little terrifying. I wasn't really in good shape. And so we started talking about it a couple of years ago. And so, you know, it was just like this thing of having to face it. It was like something when I was younger and I was doing this stuff, it was easier to do. And, um, so that became an interesting challenge. And also thinking about like, why is it different? Like, why do I think about it differently? And then talking to Daza, when Daza and I started talking about doing this, Daza hadn't uh, done a lowrider show in 14 years, you know? And so um, we decided to go to a show and Daza went to the super show in Phoenix, which is, you know, one of the, I think it's the most attended super show. There's 20,000 people there. And she did her thing. Her mom came, she had her merch. She made like $10,000 in like five minutes, you know? I mean, it was crazy how people were just swarming to her and how um, like, sexy and provocative she was even though she hadn't been like doing the same stuff and was like you know around 50. Um, so that was really inspiring you know and then so I mean I just it became like an interesting challenge and then also just you know Lisa Lyon is someone I've admired since I was a student you know so um, diving back into that, you know, seemed really interesting to me as someone like, you know, I really thought about her as like the ultimate, like kind of method actor, but pushing it further. And I had mentioned that word before, but that really, that idea really, I really started thinking about that because of looking at these photographs. And, um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just, again, like, it's almost like the nursing image. It's like life happens and you're making work and then you have to use it somehow. And yeah. so, and, and Liz, can you briefly talk about the life of others? Because that really, you know, connects those bodies of work as well. Oh, stories better told by others. Yeah. Right. So in between, in between these things, um, I dug into my archive of magazines, really um, kind of reflecting on the fact that in 2015, Lowrider Magazine stopped using um, women on its cover. And then there were kind of some other arenas in which the kind of history of low riding was being cemented without images of sexualized images of women. And it just seems so prudish to me and so weird that, you know, that this kind of supposedly feminist gesture of taking off the models, whatever, was like basically erasing, you know, this huge group of people's participation and kind of the production of a, of a certain culture and the attitude and style and fashion, you know, as so I just, um, so I was responding to that. And also I think it was like a turn in the work for me. I had been, while I was building the car, I had been for so many years just, you know, and like negotiating my, my existence among groups of men. And that was interesting for me, you know, that was part of the, you know, challenge of belonging in the shop environments, right? Like how do I belong? as a freak member amongst like all these guys. And, um, and so when I was looking at the magazine covers that in my archive of magazines and seeing them like together, you know, as a group, you know, I was like, wow, I wanna be with all of them. <laughs> and so I found a way to do that through celebrating all these gals on the covers that I thought were really kind of special um, where I, photograph them on top of these automotive synergy suedes. Um, they're these really bright, colorful suedes. And um, 
and with some kind of, you know, old shoes of mine and car parts. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I had Bugs Gonzalez, Efrain Gonzalez, who's um, really one of the famous, famous low riding pinstripers and he does lettering and he did the enamel hand lettering on each photograph. So each photograph has the name of the model, which would have, you know, in the magazine been tucked in somewhere in the magazine, you know, it wasn't the kind of the first thing that you would know the name of the model, so. Um, that's yeah, really I mean, where our collaboration <laughs> began for this project was yeah. basically right there. And, you know, um, when you asked me about curatorial practice, you know, 80% of what I do are commission-based works. And in the last several years, we've had, you know, we're 75% of the exhibitions are with uh, female artists as well. So part of that, um, part of, of a, uh, the ASU Art Museum is really, um, looking and working with a new context with um, presenting um, projects at the museum. Um, Liz, I was interested in sort of, you know, we've talked in the past about, you know, this idea of like ob objectification and sort of, you know, at what point can it take a wrong turn in terms of like, what are, what are the consequences of objectification? I mean, in terms of sort of like feminist history and feminist practice, like this is something that we seem to want to uh, resist. And sort of, I wonder if you could speak about like the potential violence of like removing one's sexuality or um, um, particularly uh, maybe um, someone in their middle age and what that means. Yeah, I mean, look, it's um, like objectification is something that we, we do. It's going to always be here, you know. So I think the thing is like how we use ourselves, you know, in terms of, you know, how much we do for our, do things for ourselves and how much we do things for others and what the dynamic is between kind of that, that what's the relationship of those two kind of acts or drives. And, um, you know, I do think it's a problem, you know, especially if, I think this idea that to, to avoid that, you know, I guess moral dilemma or dilemma or whatever you wanna call it, that the answer would be to take away that kind of part of the self, the kind of more sexualized part of the self or a particular way of being sexualized, you know? And I think, you know, that when that happens, it's like we lose a part of being our full selves. I mean, there's so many ways to be, have sex appeal. So I don't wanna say there's only one way to do that, but, I also think that women get looked at under a microscope all the time. And there's like just this judginess, you know, that is nonstop. And it's like, why is this necessarily bad? You know, it's only, it can be bad. Lots of things can be bad. Um, so, but I think that the bigger harm is when um, we aren't allowed to be kind of full selves with all kind of the different facets of, you know, what makes us human and, you know, caring about um, sex appeal in a certain way, I think is part of being human, but. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, I think we can begin to open to questions from the audience now if, um, if there are um, questions for Liz or Julio, um, we can begin to sort of bring those into um, the Q&A um, hosted, I think by, by Brooke and Royal will help us field those, field those questions from the audience. Awesome, this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Deandra, for moderating. Um, our first question comes from Charlie uh, at, here at the rail. Charlie, you should be able to unmute. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Julio. It was really great to take that little tour of your show and to, to listen to you speak about it. Thank you so much. I, uh, I, liked, I liked the phrase you used, freak member, and freak membership somehow. That's, I, I feel like that kind of describes uh, my comrades here at the rail and how I, I like to <laughs> think about generally my place uh, in the groups that I participate in. Um, I... I didn't know a lot about your work beforehand and I've been learning so much as I watch. Um, and I'm really attracted to the all different types of photographic images that I've seen uh, so far. And one of the questions kind of broad, but simple was just um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, like your photographic, the, the, how you make compositional decisions in your photographic process um, and, and just sort of how that, how that 
you know, unfolds. I guess the two, two that really, if I were to ask you to talk about specific images or bodies of work, um, the, the, the body of work that included your nursing image and the body of work uh, from the most recent commission seemed particularly um, striking in their, you know, different um, pursuits and processes. So yeah, yeah, if you could just talk to that. Well, you know, I mean, like probably most of us on this grid of humans here, I love looking at art. So like I'm looking at images all the time and um, printing them out and collecting them and putting them on the wall and thinking about them. And so for example, for um, that image on the Rio Grande, so I should say that image was shot on the Rio Grande. And so that's in Texas and the other side of the river is Mexico. And I, um, and that, like I said before, was um, a commissioned by Ballroom Marfa. And so I started thinking a lot about like, okay, what would it mean to do this there? And thinking about nursing and thinking about being a mother because I was a new mother and thinking about all those things made me look at many different things. So I was looking at images of Liz Taylor and Giant, the, the movie Giant. I was looking at um, Lola, la, Lola La Trailera, which is about a um, woman truck driver. I was looking at um, I don't know, like Remus and Romulus. <laughs> I was looking at tons of stuff. I mean, the obvious things. And, um, and then for the, re for the stuff in Body Magic, it's much more direct. I mean, you can see that it is coming from directly from those kind of Maplethorpe images. But I was also looking at other things at the same time, like, you know, the suede. I use those synergy suede again in the background. Um, and that's the backdrop. And then the, um, I was of course looking at Daza as I do all the time, but I was also reading um, Lisa Lyon's Body Magic book and thinking about the kind of ways she thought about training as an additive process instead of like a punitive subtractive process, it's an additive process. And it's really interesting in her book, Body Magic, she talks a lot about being very targeted about shaping the body and how you can manage, you can, I mean, it's about sculpting, right? And so, um, and the different ways she kind of sees um, like women's energy and feline kind of animalistic. Anyway, it's a, it's a pretty groovy book. I recommend it, it's very 80s. <laughs> and uh, so I was looking at that and, um, but I'm just, you know, I'm consuming the stuff that kind of makes sense for the work all the time and putting it on the wall. and. I always try to print those stuff out as just like black and white laser prints to kind of, um, I guess, simplify them a bit so I can see them in a different way. But I was I was not surprised, I guess. But it, it, when uh, Dihandra mentioned that um, in the story about Daza, like, oh, they wouldn't have let me done that, um, and how Lowrider, how the people that made Lowrider were partially responsible for a certain way. Um, or parameters, perhaps limitations, maybe even better word for how Daza was able to be represented in the magazine. And and I felt like I heard you kind of uh, push back on that when you were like, "Oh, they would." They said no nursing, so like I'm gonna do that. I'm curious if there were at, at any other moments of like a recognized limitation somewhere, and you just thought, "Well, this is this is the moment to you know." I mean, I think that's just probably like, I think artists do that. I'm just gonna generalize, but um, but no, I mean, I think I grew up in a really, a family where we were really thinking about service and social justice and kind of how to participate. And, you know, that sometimes you, you can't do what everybody else is doing if you wanna do the right thing or if you wanna be true to yourself or you wanna be authentic. So, I mean, I, you know, I used to thank my parents for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks Liz thank you awesome thank you for the question Charlie our next question comes from Gilbert Vicario Gilbert you should be able to unmute you're muted I apologize for that um, although not readily apparent uh, I think Liz Cohen's work connects very strongly with the history of conceptual art in Colombia and with the work of a very under-recognized photographer from Cali, Colombia named Fernel Franco, especially in relation to sex worker series that Liz did in Panama. In this way, Liz takes a unique double-pronged position 
that complicates our understanding of both Latinx art and contemporary Latin American art. I'm wondering, Liz, if you have any plans on reconnecting with your Colombian roots on any potential future projects. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, I got really interested in, so I, I saw, well, there's a story in my family that my mom um, crashed into a tree when she was learning how to drive in a Russian Jeep. And I was like, why the hell did my mom learn how to drive on a Russian Jeep, you know? And so the kind of car was a gas 69 and it looks like a Jeep Willie. And so I was doing some research and I figured out that um, there was a trade deal done at the end of the 60s. So during the Cold War between Colombia and the Soviet Union where they were trading cars for coffee. And so, you know, kind of with that as a jumping off point, um, I started thinking a lot about this car and thinking about um, coffee production. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm on the kind of beginnings of a project where I'm going to get one of these gas 69s and convert it into kind of this ambulant sculpture that's a that can make coffee. And I'd like to intersect with laborers that engage with coffee, whether it's like a union sanctioned coffee break or, you know, someone that serves coffee in a corporate environment, or really um, what I'm really interested in are these women's co-ops in Central and South America that are coffee growing co-ops. And um, so I've been thinking about coffee beans, kind of the coffee bean slit as kind of like a vagina, women agricultural workers, women, you know, women's labor as it relates to coffee. And then just the history of this car is so fascinating because the gas, its production began before the Bolshevik revolution and Henry Ford actually helped start the factory in Russia. And then um, during the Soviet era, of course, there was you know, no US involvement. And then uh, after the Soviet era, Bo Anderson, who was a, an executive at, at um, GM, ended up becoming the CEO of, um, of Gaz. So anyways, it's got this also this interesting kind of relationship with um, the Americas and you know they're all over Latin America and they're in Colombia they're used a lot in um, coffee kind of festivals when they have a coffee carnival they'll be loaded up with coffee beans in the back and drive just on the back two wheels and so in any case that's some I don't even know what that's going to become these projects are long and winding so yeah thank you for asking and thank you for framing um, my work in such a beautiful way. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, Olga, I think you had a question for Liz as well. Yeah, Liz, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I was able to see the exhibition, thankfully, and not just have a virtual engagement with it. But you also had a video of work in the exhibition that uh, edited together different moments from your engagement with Daza. And I was really struck by many of those images and moments and the music that you selected to accompany it and focusing on those unposed moments before she set up the shot. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and is this a new direction? Have you made video works before? Yeah, I mean, I've done video works in the in the past. Um, so there's, there's some in the exhibition like the Bikini Car Wash video and the Hydro Forest, which was a video performance um, when I was pregnant with my son and the Trabantamina going up and down. And, um, you know, so, so I think what's great about that piece is it really kind of the dynamic with Daza really comes through in the sense that she's like a natural and I'm not, you know? <laughs> and so just the way she moves her body and me trying to emulate her, you know, earnestly, I mean, it's not like self-conscious in the video or whatever, but, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, trying to do what she's doing and we're trying to do what Lisa Lyon was doing. And um, anyway, it also, I think these things again that happen that you don't expect, like one of the things I was telling Daza at the beginning of our shoot was that I, I really wanted to find Lisa Lyon and that I hadn't been able to talk to her. And, um, and then we, she was like, well, what do you know about her? And I, and I just said, you know, I know that 
Um, one of the last things you can find out about her besides being inducted into the Bodybuilders Hall of Fame is that she was married for a year to a French pop star. And so then we just started joking around and we're like, maybe she still lives in Paris. Maybe she's just not using the internet in Paris. Maybe there's no, maybe she's just not using social media in Paris. And so then we just started being silly and it was like, she's like, Lisa, you came, you came from Paris. And so that's part of the soundtrack is us, you know, trying to channel Lisa from Paris, which I'm sure that's not where she is, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Olga. And I just wanted to know also that we had a few people in the audience um, who asked about your future work, Liz. And so thank you for, uh, for mentioning that and sort of answering our kind of collective question. Um, for our next question, it comes from Cindy Huang, and I will read it out loud. She is asking, can you talk more about the use of communist symbology throughout your work, thinking of the hammer and sickle display in the show, and how viewers, especially in Arizona, have responded? Well, I mean, I think for me, I mean, one thing I should say is the way that um, that kind of imagery and the history, those kind of histories of political thought or economic thought um, have a really different relationship to um, pedestrian life in Latin America than they do in the United States. So I think like here we have a much more resistant, I'm just generalizing, but you know, it's, um, I guess like this commie thing is very hard for certain people in the United States, but it's much more in Latin America, you know, you just, you feel the Soviet influence a lot more. And even the influence from like China, like people in the sixties, I mean, I don't know. I talked to my aunt and uncle, aunts and uncles, and some of them were Maoists, some of us were Trotskyists, but I think like here, that seems like it would be so radical. And I think in Latin America with the history of revolutions and it's, it's just a different, so I think in terms of Latinidad, like Latin American or Latinx identity, I think this is kind of something that's more a part of it. And in my work, I seek to recognize that because in terms of the way I see my kind of identity, the way that kind of stereotypes the United States around like kind of Latinx identities, they don't really, um, I don't really, they don't really fit what my life or home life were like. And so, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm like winding around the question, but um, I don't know. I've never really gotten that much pushback about any of it. Um, maybe because it's so playful and aestheticized in the, in the work. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for Thank the you question. For yeah. uh, one of our last questions comes from Susan Landgraf. Susan, you should be able to unmute. Well, I got here late, so I missed the nursing photographs, which I'm really sorry. And Liz, um, I I would have liked to see the whole the whole presentation because I really don't know your work. Um, what you were just saying about the difference the difference between um, South American and Central American attitudes towards. Um, political thought was was really wonderfully stated and um, and the comparison with um, the way minds are set here in this country the, the thing the thing that brought me to the question was as you were introducing the um, Maplethorpe's images of Lisa Lyons suddenly I'm and what's being said I'm suddenly thinking of Annie Sprinkle and I'm wondering um, where Annie Sprinkle comes into this trajectory that you followed because she had to have, your relationship to her ideas, her performance, her photography had to be part of this trajectory. Could you comment on that in some way? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I was going to, undergrad in the 90s in art school. I mean, the, the Annie Sprinkle was something we talked about and she was doing her performances, you know, on stage, you know, like ejaculating on the stage. And I mean, she's outrageous, you know, and it was exciting and learning about, you know, the way she, I mean, I guess, you know, really thinking about it, the way she um, reframed the way you could think about porn 
um, and that kind of activity and the playing cards. And then later on the kind of, I, I remember just loving the, um, the boob monoprints where she's just like laying her boobs in ink and then laying her boobs on the paper. And um, I think like as someone that kind of, you know, I guess to use the, like a phrase that we all know, like flip the script. I mean, she's someone that's really kind of an amazing figure. And um, yeah, I mean, I have nothing but like admiration. Good. I just, I just would, I wanted her to be mentioned in this context because yeah. um, I think she's very important. Um, well, you said flip the script. I love that expression. Yeah. But um, I think she, she needs to be known. The people of even younger than your generation yeah. need and to I know about the work that she did. I mean, she was traveling around with a speculum so that women could look inside their own vaginas and see what was actually there, um, which was astonishing. Well, I mean, I think still she's so, you know, focused on like making sure people connect to their bodies with pleasure, you know, and I think that's like the, you know, and her aesthetic is so um, outrageous and garish and I love it, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, she's a hero. Good, good. Thank yeah. you. I'm, I'm, thank you for that. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you, Susan. Our last question comes from our publisher and artistic director, Fong Bui. Fong, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Liz. Isandra, uh, Julio, and Olga. I don't know why you mention um, any sprinkle, Susan, because <laughs> I have a poster of the movie. I think it's called My Father's Coming. Is that possible? Yes, so my father's come in, Liz. My question is very in, uh, simply based on the fact that there's a long history involving, of course, the Panama Canal since Theodore Roosevelt literally stole the province of Panama from Colombia in 1903. But thinking about law writer, because I know nothing about a little bit, really not much, but it definitely associate with post-war America. It definitely had to do with the 50s where why on one hand celebrating American as the next empire succeeding the British empire more or less. Martial law was created uh, around the world, building so many military bases and, and whatnot. But it's also a, 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 at home is a serious suppression you know, there's a lot of political McCart McCarthyism going on at the same time. Uh, and I, I was thinking in, in regard to body performing as a subject, can't help but think of uh, Warhol, 1961, mm -hmm. before and after, you know, and I was thinking that context. So it's a simulation of between before and after. I don't mean just plastic children, mm -hmm. you know, but the way you pair the, the images together. So I wonder whether that at all relate anything, since we're talking about fathers coming anyway, whether that <laughs> before and after have any relationship, your own relation to psychoanalysis. To make mm. a, <laughs> I don't know. This is a lot, Fong. This is a lot. Um, let's see where to begin. Where to begin? Okay. Um, well, I think this idea of before and yeah, you know, I mean, just like to break it out into like a general thing. The idea of before and after has so much to do with trauma, right? Like it has Absolutely. the assumption of a of a turning point, right? Where there's a, 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 a an identity or a world before, and there's an identity and a world after. Mm -hmm. You know, so Panama, of course, that that cut in the soil is like that symbol of that trauma for that before and after that you're talking about that, you know, the kind of political before and the political after the nationhood before the nationhood after. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think that these really kind of binary ways of looking at things in general um, are always rooted in trauma, right? The way we look at gender, the way um, you know, and I guess like when you talk about, I guess when I talk about the freak membership, 
you know, and I think, you know what, I mean, people do it all the time, but I mean, it's all about disrupting those kind of, I mean, hopefully those things, I mean, now I feel like I'm going to sound so cheesy, but hopefully those things are healing in a kind of way where you can <laughs> unify the self again, Fong. I don't know. <laughs> that was a stretch, but I tried. <laughs> That's where queer theory comes in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One way to heal. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Fong. Thanks for, thanks for making this possible. Moving to poetry, at the rail, we have a tradition of, en uh, of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I'm thrilled to welcome Fong again to read a poem by Jenny Zhang to close the program. And a little bit about Jenny. Uh, Jenny Zhang is the author of the short story and poetry collections, Sour Heart, Dear Jenny, We Are All Find and Forthcoming, My Baby's First Birthday. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's N Plus One and elsewhere. And she has taught at Columbia University, the New School and various NYC public high schools. Fong, take it away. Thank you, Jess. So I'm reading one poem by Jenny. It's called, I'm Not Like You. And don't you ever forget, it takes practice to access what you demolish. When you see us, you feel something for the first time. You just like me because I'm actually interested in all the years I did not know that were rough for me, wasted so much time thanking useless people just because they have floor to ceiling shelving and natural light in every room, a car in a parking garage to take them to the end of the nearest peninsula, the history of merry men bore of jerking off into their own hands definitely precedes me. Our flesh isn't any softer. We just moisturize and care the sheen from fighting, make us glow really nicely, having something real to fight against. A pretty hard, you gotta admit you and your spouse think it through. You hate me and my friends who address the world from the vantage point of, you know, lions, feelings of fucking heart. And don't you ever forget it takes practice to access what you demolish. When you see us, you feel something for the first time. You act like you are not that turn on. The shit gets you hard is a debased topic that you prefer and keep your pages clean. Read critics who describe our ideas at rousing, spirited, important brain. You live with someone who sanitizes everything even before this and definitely after listen. Let your pussy breathe for once in your goddamn life. It will be easy to come if you don't smell like flowers. My friends and I smell like we've been outside. We sweat through the seats and take the bus to the beach. We want to play in the waves at the end of the islet. You would love rub against me in person one day, wouldn't you? When I tell you about that photographer, you say you sorry, woman, me like have to constantly deal with men like that. But I know when I go home later tonight, the details of my solid story are what keeps you going. No one has ever wanted to fuck the person they must access with. That's why I'm not surprised to know. You imagine me constantly, don't you, underwear bunched down by my ankles flip over onto my stomach. You wish you knew me better, like really actually knew me back then when I thought I was so disgusting. It turned out I'd always been interesting, not that I expected you or your blood family to admit everything about your fantasy life comes from women like me. Every single time you forgot your earthly problems, felt your flesh as starting point, dream real legit dreams. You better believe it was me fucking me and my friends whose name are only other when you need to feel better. And if, if it wasn't for us, where do you think you would be now. Seriously, tell me what meaning would your life have if we were no longer buried under the very breath you've been trampling on since the first 
in your life was born and decided to stay. Thank you. Thank you, Fong. And thank you, Olga. Thank you, Deandra. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you to everyone today who tuned in and for all of your questions. Um, please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading curated by Jacob Bromberg, featuring readings by M. Naborze Philip, Jane Hirschfield, and Timothy Donnelly. The Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great day. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Olga. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. Thank you. Nice reading, Fong. Great reading, Fong. Amazing reading, Fong. Thank you for Jenny. Jenny's poem. You know, that was amazing. Um, everybody's here, so thank you so much. Craig's here. John's here. George is here. Hello. That's great to see many friends. Thank you. Tell me. Thank you so much, you guys.